how do you approach asking these big questions and trying to uh, formulate it as a paper, as an experiment to, that could make a prediction, all that kind of stuff? What's your process? There's a very interesting things that happens once you're a theoretical physicist, once you become trained. You're a graduate student, you've written some papers and whatever. Suddenly, you are the world's expert in a really infinitesimally tiny area of knowledge, right? And you know not that much about other areas. There's an overwhelming temptation to just drill deep right? Just keep doing basically the thing that you started doing. But maybe that thing you started doing is not the most interesting thing to the world or to you or, or whatever. So you need to separately develop the capability of stepping back and going, okay, now that I can write papers in that area, now that I'm sort of trained enough in the general procedure, what is the best match between my interests, my abilities, and what is actually interesting? And honestly, I, I've not been very good at that over my career. Um, you know, I have my, my process traditionally was I was working in this general area of particle physics, field theory, general relativity, cosmology, and I would sort of try to take things other people were talking about and ask myself whether or not it really fit together. Like my my two, so I guess I have three papers that I've ever written that uh, have done super well in terms of getting cited and things like that. One was my first ever paper that I get very little credit for. That was my advisor and his collaborator, you know, set that up. The other two were basically my idea. One was um, right after we discovered that the universe was accelerating. So in 1998, observations showed that not only is the universe expanding, but it's expanding faster and faster. So that's attributed to either Einstein's cosmological constant or some more complicated form of dark energy, some mysterious thing that fills the universe. And people were throwing around ideas about this dark energy stuff, what could it be, and so forth. Most of the people throwing around these ideas were cosmologists. They work on cosmology. They think about the universe all at once. I, you know, since I like to talk to people in different areas, I was sort of more familiar than average with what a respectable working particle physicist would think about these things. And what I immediately thought was, you know, you guys are throwing around these theories. These theories are wildly unnatural. They're super finely tuned. Like any particle physicist would just be embarrassed to be talking about this. But rather than just scoffing at them, I sat down and asked myself, okay, is there a respectable version? Is there a way to keep the particle physicist happy but also make the universe accelerate? And I realized that there is some very specific set of models that is, that is relatively natural. And guess what? You can make a new experimental prediction on the basis of those. And so I did that. People were very happy about that. What was the thing that would make physicists happy that would make sense of this uh, fragile thing that people call dark energy? So the fact that dark energy pervades the whole universe and is slowly changing that should immediately set off alarm bells because particle physics is a story of length scales and time scales that are generally, guess what? Small, <laughs> right? Particles are small, they vibrate quickly, and you're telling me now I have a new field and its typical rate of change is once every billion years, right? Like that's just not natural. And indeed, you can formalize that and say, you know, look, even if you wrote down a particle that evolved slowly over billions of years, if you let it interact with other particles at all, that would make it inter uh, in move faster. Its dynamics would be faster. Its mass would be higher, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole story. Things need to be robust, and they all talk to each other in quantum field theory. So how do you stop that from happening? And the answer is symmetry. You can impose a symmetry that protects your new field from talking to any other fields, okay? And this is good for two reasons. Number one, it can keep the dynamics slow. So if you just, you can't tell me why it's slow, you just made that up, but at least it can protect it from speeding up because it's not talking to any other particles. And the other is it makes it harder to detect. Um, naively, experiments looking for fifth forces or time changes of fundamental constants of nature like the charge of the electron, these experiments should have been able to detect these dark energy fields. And I was able to propose a way to stop that from happening. The detection. 
the detection yet to sort because a, a symmetry could stop it from interacting with all these other fields and therefore makes it harder to detect. And just by luck, I realized, because it was actually based on my first ever paper, there's one loophole. If you impose these symmetries, so you protect the dark energy field from interacting with any other fields, there's one interaction that is still allowed that you can't rule out. And it is a very specific interaction between your dark energy field and photons, which are very common. And it has the following effect. As a photon travels through the dark energy, the photon has a polarization, up, down, left, right, whatever it happens to be. And as it travels through the dark energy, that photon will rotate its polarization. This is called birefringence. And you can kind of run the numbers and say, you know, you can't make a very precise prediction because we're just making up this model. But if you want to roughly fit the data, you can predict how much polarization rotation there should be. A couple of degrees, okay? Not that much. So that's very hard to detect. People have been trying to do it. Right now, literally, we're on the edge of either being able to detect it or rule it out using the cosmic microwave background. And there is just, you know, truth in advertising, there is a claim on the market that it's been detected, that it's there. Uh, it's not very statistically significant. If I were to bet, I think it would probably go away. It's a very hard thing to observe. But maybe as you get better and better data, cleaner and cleaner analysis, it will persist and we will have directly detected the dark energy. So if we just take this tangent of dark energy, people will sometimes bring up dark energy and dark matter as an example why physicists have lost it, <laughs> lost their mind. We're just going to say that there's this field that permeates everything, it's unlike any other field and it's invisible. Uh, and it uh, helps us work out some of the math. Uh, how do you respond to that? <laughs> Those kinds of suggestions. Well, two ways. One way is, those people would have had to say the same thing when we discovered the planet Neptune. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's exactly analogous, where we have a very good theory, in that case, Newtonian gravity in the solar system. We made predictions. The predictions were slightly off for the motion of the outer planets. You found that you could explain that motion by positing something very simple, one more planet in a very, very particular place. And you went and looked for it, and there it was, right? It's That was the first successful example of finding dark matter in the universe. <laughs> so matter that we can't see. Neptune was dark. Yeah. There's a difference between dark matter and dark energy, right? Dark matter, as far as we are hypothesizing it, um, is a particle of some sort. It's just a particle that interacts with us very weakly. So we know how much of it there is. We know more or less where it is. We know some of its properties. We don't know specifically what it is. But it you know, it's it's not anything fundamentally mysterious. It's a particle. Dark energy is a different story. So dark energy is indeed uniformly spread throughout space and has this very weird property that it doesn't seem to evolve as far as we can tell. It's the same amount of energy in every cubic centimeter of space from moment to moment in time. That's why far and away the leading candidate for dark energy is Einstein's cosmological constant. The cosmological constant is strictly constant, 100% constant. The data say it had better be 98% constant or better. So 100% constant works, right? And it's also very robust. It's just there. It's not doing anything. It doesn't interact with any other particles. It makes perfect sense. Probably the dark energy is the cosmological constant. The dark matter, super important to emphasize here, you know, it was hypothesized at first in the 70s and 80s, mostly to explain the rotation of galaxies. Today, the evidence for dark matter is both much better than it was in the 1980s and from different sources. It is mostly from observations of the cosmic background radiation or of large-scale structure. So we have multiple independent lines of evidence, also gravitational lensing and things like that, many, many pieces of evidence that say that dark matter is there. Um, and, and also that say that the effects of dark matter are different than if we modified gravity. So that, so that was my first answer to your question is, dark matter, we have a lot of evidence for. But the other one is, of course, we would love it if it weren't dark matter. <laughs> Our vested interest is 100% aligned 
with it being something more cool and interesting than dark matter because dark matter is just a particle. That's the most boring thing in the world. And it's uh, non-uniformly distributed through space, dark matter? Absolutely, yeah. And so this You can even see maps of it that we've constructed from gravitational lensing. So verifiable sort of clumps yeah. of dark matter in the galaxy that explain stuff. Bigger than the galaxy, sadly. Like we think that in the galaxy, dark matter is lumpy, but it's it's just, it's weaker. Its effects are weaker. But of the scale of large scale structure and clusters of galaxies and things like that, yes, we can show you where the dark matter is. Could there be a super cool explanation for dark matter that would be interesting as opposed to just another particle that, that sits there in clumps? The super cool explanation would be modifying gravity rather than inventing a new particle. Oh. Sadly, that doesn't really work. We've tried. I've tried. Uh, that's my third paper that was very successful. I tried to unify dark matter and dark energy together. That was my idea. That was my aspiration, not even idea. I tried to do it. It failed even before we wrote the paper. I realized <laughs> that my idea did not help. It helps. It could possibly explain away the dark energy but it would not explain away the dark matter. And so I thought it was not that interesting actually. And then two different collaborators of mine said, has anyone thought of this idea? Like they thought of exactly the same idea completely independently of me. I said, well, if three different people found the same idea, maybe it is interesting. And so we wrote the paper. <laughs> and yeah, it was very interesting. People are very interested. In Can it. you describe this this paper a little bit? Like it's just, it's, it's fascinating how much of a thing there is, dark energy and dark matter, and mm -hmm. we don't quite understand it. So what, what was your dive into the exploring how to unify the two? So here is what we know about dark matter and dark energy. Um, they become important in regimes where gravity is very, very, very weak. That's kind of the opposite from what you would expect if you actually were modifying gravity. Like there's a rule of thumb in quantum field theory, et cetera, that new effects show up when the effects are strong, right? We, uh, we understand weak fields, we don't understand strong fields. But okay, maybe this is different, right? So what do I mean by when gravity is weak? The dark energy shows up late in the history of the universe. Early in the history of the universe, the dark energy is irrelevant. But remember, the density of dark energy stays constant the density of matter and radiation go down. So at early times, the dark energy was completely irrelevant compared to matter and radiation. At late times, it becomes important. That's also when the universe is dilute and gravity is relatively weak. Now think about galaxies, okay? A galaxy is more dense in the middle, less dense on the outside. And there is a phenomenological fact about galaxies that in the interior of galaxies, you don't need dark matter. That's not so surprising because the density of stars and gas is very high there and the dark matter is just subdominant. But then there's generally a, uh, a radius inside of which you don't need dark matter to fit the data, outside of which you do need dark matter to fit the data. So that's again, when gravity is weak, right? So I asked myself, um, of course we know in field theory, new effects should show up when fields are strong, not weak, but let's throw that out of the window. Can I write down a theory where gravity alters when it is weak? And we've already said what gravity is. What is gravity? It's the curvature of space-time. So there are mathematical quantities that measure the curvature of space-time. And generally, you would say, like, I have an understanding. Einstein's equation, which I explained to the readers in the book, um, relates the curvature of space-time to matter and energy. The more matter and energy, the more curvature. So I'm saying, what if you add a new term in there that says the less matter and energy, the more curvature? No reason to do that, mm -hmm. except to fit the data, right? So I tried to unify the need for dark matter and the need for dark energy. That would be really cool if that was the case. Like, Super cool, right? It'd be the best. It'd be great. But it, it'd it be didn't work. <laughs> but it'd be really interesting if gravity did something funky when uh, when, when there's not much of it. Like they're almost like at the edges of it, it gets yeah. like noisy. That was exactly the hope, right? <laughs> but oh, the great thing about physics is there are equations, right? I mean, you can come up with the words and you can wave your hands, but then you got to write down the equations, and I did. And I figured out that it could help with the dark energy, the acceleration of the universe. It doesn't help with dark matter at all. Yeah. It just sucks that the scale of galaxies and scale of solar systems uh the physics is kind of boring yeah it does i agree 
<laughs> again, that's why it is a little bit, I tear my hair out when people who are not physicists think, you know, accuse physicists, like you say, of sort of losing the plot because they need dark matter and dark energy. I don't want dark matter and dark energy. I want something much cooler than that. I've tried, but you got to listen to the equations and to the data. You mentioned three papers, your first ever, your first awesome paper ever, yeah. and your second awesome paper ever. Of course, you wrote many papers, so it's you're 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 being very harsh on the others. But uh. well, by the way, this is not awesomeness. This is impact. Impact, right? Sure. There's no correlation <laughs> between awesomeness and impact. Right. Some of my best papers fell without a stone. Tree and falls vice versa, in the forest. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the first paper was called Limits on a Lorentz and Parity Violating Modification of Electromagnetism or Electrodynamics. So we figured out how to violate Lorentz invariance, which is the symmetry underlying relativity. And the important thing is we figured out a way to do it that didn't violate anything else and was experimentally testable. So people love that. Uh, the second paper was called Quintessence and the Rest of the World. So quintessence is this dynamical dark energy field. The rest of the world is because I was talking about how the quintessence field would interact with other particles and fields and how to avoid the interactions you don't want. And the third paper was called, um, is cosmic speed up due to gravitational physics, something like that. So you see the common theme. I'm taking you know what we know, the standard model of particle physics, general relativity, tweaking them in some way, and then trying to fit the data. And trying to make it so it's experimentally validated. Ideally, yes, that's right. That's the goal. 